This is Liberty Law Talk, part of Liberty Fund's online library of law and liberty. Your host is Liberty Fund fellow Richard Reinch. Our web address is libertylawsite.org, where you can subscribe, comment, find other episodes and links related to today's conversation. Our email address is lal at libertyfund.org. Today, we are talking with Michael Anton about the San Francisco Compromise, or how it came to be that Silicon Valley money married San Francisco leftism and is now rapidly redefining American culture and politics. Michael Anton is a native Californian who now lives in New York. His writings have appeared in the Claremont Review of Books, City Journal, and the Weekly Standard, among other publications. Michael, welcome to the program. Thank you very much. Very happy to be here. Michael, in an essay entitled uh, San Francisco Values that you wrote for the Claremont Review of Books a few months back, you uh, stated that San Francisco, the city of San Francisco, has now uh, sort of found its purpose or its, its great calling it's always believed itself to have uh, of being um, you know, this wonderful American city. Uh, that, w- that would define the country in various ways. You said that had long escaped the city, but now, uh, through the influence of Silicon Valley uh, and its you know, uh, huge amounts of capital, it had been able to do that. Um, uh, talk about that, uh, that sort of the San Francisco compromise, the term you use in the essay, that has sort of brought, or brought this to the fore, and, and what sort of the defining ethos of that is. Well, the San Francisco Compromise is, of course, a riff on Booker T. Washington's famous phrase, the Atlanta Compromise, which was a speech he gave, uh, you might remember the year, I don't, sometime in the 1890s, right? Or might have been a little later than that uh, in the Teddy Roosevelt administration. Anyway, the Atlanta Compromise was basically a way, was Booker T. Washington's argument to black Americans is that, you know, and, and to white Americans, you know, we're, we'll do X if you do Y, and this is how we're going to, at least, if not solve, we're going to muddle through the, you know, the racial tensions in, in America. And this is, of course, in the Jim Crow South, so long before the Civil Rights Movement. So I, I made a kind of more joke calling the San Francisco Compromise is how does, how did a city that since the 19, mid-1960s at least has been synonymous with liberalism become the richest place in the world? Yeah. Where, you know, if, where if you haven't founded and sold a company for tens of millions of dollars by the time you're 25, you're a failure, where, you know, a two-bedroom nondescript apartment now costs two and a half million dollars, these kinds of things. And, you know, I, you know, how did, how did, you know, leftism was always defined as, you know, free stuff, cheap stuff, equality for all. And now the most liberal city in the world is the most uh, the richest and most unequal city in the world, and how did that happen? And the San Francisco Compromise is, in a way, uh, the way that the leftists made peace with money, in my opinion, and made money and, and sort of whitewashed it, or money, you know, I call it, um, I think I call it sociological money laundering in the piece, something like that. It's, it's, you know, there's bad money and there's good money. You know, bad money is kind of earned on Wall Street or by opening a string of car washes or something like that. Well, good money is when you sell your photo sharing app for $10 million or $100 million and, you know, you buy a, 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 an old wreck in Pacific Heights and fix it up and you start giving, donating to causes that want to give wireless laptops to the Mongolian steppes, right? And so they, San Francisco has managed to make, to make money moral but only if it's derived in a certain way and spent in a certain way. Yeah, you, you, you note uh, in the essay Salon, CEO David Talbot, in his, in his book Season of the Witch, uh, <clears throat> attempted to define San Francisco values. And yeah, he said, he it's said, an old yeah. phrase, actually. It goes back a long way. Talbot just, you know, tries to put a spin on it. But the, nobody knows. I tried to figure out where it came from, and I couldn't. Um, but it, it at least goes back to the early 80s. Now, Gene Kirkpatrick, of course, gave a famous speech. So the Democratic National Convention, uh, 1984, which nominated Walter Mondale, was held at the Moscone Center in San Francisco. And one, after, one speaker after another got up and just denounced Reagan and American foreign policy and, and so on from the podium. And Gene Kirkpatrick at the GOP convention the same year gave a famous speech denouncing the so-called San Francisco Democrats. And the line that, of course, stuck out for everyone was, you know, they always blame America first. Now, San Fran- I went to Berkeley as an undergrad, but, which is right across the bay, and it sort of has the same ethos, although just even more left-wing. So what, whatever you take San Francisco to be, just, you know, if San Francisco is 10 on your volume dial, Berkeley's like 11 or 11 and a half. And, you know, they, these were the, two of the first cities in the whole of the United States to have their own foreign policy. 
they would, the city council would pass <laughs> resolutions saying, yeah. we're going to, you know, we denounce this, we do this, we do that. I always loved the fact that Berkeley, what, you, would, you, would, you would cross the border, uh, either north or south, so either from Albany uh, from the north or Oakland from the south, and there'd be a big sign saying, you're now entering a nuclear-free zone in a city that built the nuclear weapon, <laughs> that built the, the, you know, J. Robert Oppenheimer and the gang built the bomb from Berkeley. Glenn Seaborg discovered plutonium at Berkeley, and there's an operating nuclear reactor in the Berkeley Hills, but it was a nuclear-free zone. It's just that kind of foolish, symbolic politics that completely defines the Bay Area. So San Francisco values was a phrase. I, couldn't, I tried to figure out where it came from. I couldn't determine whether it was first said as a matter of pride or as an insult. The left seems to think it was first brought up as an insult, that it was that Gene Kirkpatrick speech where everyone would talk about, you know, sneer at San Francisco values. So they tried to say, well, we're going to redefine this as a positive. San Francisco values are all the good things about liberalism. And, you know, if you try to insult us with it, well, we're just going to wear it with pride. But I, I was unable, unfortunately, I was unable to find the precise beginning of the term, but it at least goes back 30 years. Yeah, well, I remember in the '90s, Newt Gingrich using the term with derision to, you know, referring to saying yeah. Nancy Pelosi, San Francisco values, et cetera. Which I suppose yeah. you know, the way in which Newt Gingrich would use it, uh, no Republican would now use it now. Uh, it would inevitably, I think, be you know, as you say, wearing it with pride. But you know, it's funny though. Ted Cruz tried something like that on Trump in one of the debates, the York, if you remember this. The New York values, right? And yeah, it was, yeah. He meant the same thing essentially, and Trump just picked it up like a club and beat him with it because of 9-11 and other things. And it really backfired badly on Ted Cruz. Yeah. Yeah. No, I was, I was thinking, though, you know, with Talbot, you, know, so you have this list of uh, gay marriage, medical marijuana, uh, universal health care, sanctuary cities, living minimum wage, bicycle-friendly streets, uh, environmentalism, et cetera. And you note he leaves out, though, the, the ultimate part or, 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 you know, what was a huge part of this, which is money. Uh, because yeah. we don't want, we don't want to talk about money, but it's it's really the rich and the left and the need for this um, large amount of wealth in, in Silicon Valley to justify itself. Yeah. And that, and that well, regard. one of the reasons they don't want to talk about money is what made San Francisco into what it is. Yeah, one of the factors which I talk about in the essay is it it, it used to be really cheap. It was the yeah, greatest yeah, underpriced shocking. asset in American history in a way. I mean, what, so if you go back to the history, I mean, San Francisco was essentially nothing until the Spanish found it in 1769. Gaspar Portola saw it from the top of a hill on the peninsula as they were walking for one of the thing, I don't remember if I mentioned this or not, but one of the things I find fascinating is from Sir Francis Drake to, uh, I don't think Magellan, but definitely Balboa and others sailed up and down the coast of California, and they never saw the entrance to the Golden Gate because it was always shrouded in fog. For 250 years, people did not know it was there until it was seen from the land side. And once they saw it, they realized this is the greatest natural harbor in the world, which it basically is. I mean, it's, it's completely perfect as a shelter for ships and a great spot for human habitation. And even after they figured that out, it still took – another century before anybody started to live there. So when the gold rush happened, the gold rush began, um, well, the gold was discovered in, in Northern California in January of 1848, and the gold rush began really December of 1848, and obviously the year that sticks out in everybody's mind is 1849. There was nobody in San Francisco. There were like 250 people there. Didn't exist. <laughs> it became a, a town overnight because it was... Then obviously the natural port downstream from the gold fields and the mother load. So you would take a riverboat paddle steamer down the Sacramento and the American River into the Delta, into the Bay, you know, and then the real packet ships would ship the gold around Cape Horn. There was no Panama Canal in those days to the east. And this is where you bought your mining supplies. This is, you know, and so for 50 years, it was a uh, essentially a town just built on mining. When the gold ran out, it, it was fueled by the silver and copper mines in Nevada and so on and so forth. Um, and it became a rich place because of that. But, uh, you know, it was a counting house town purely based on an extractive economy and made itself by far the capital of the entire United States west of the Mississippi. I mean, it was the publishing, banking, financial, cultural, the center of everything. And it got a big head because of that. And it felt like, you know, we are, you have your Manhattan and we're San Francisco and we're the dominant city of the Pacific. Mm -hmm. And with the rise of the, rail, the railroad and later the telephone, the telegraph, et cetera, the dis discovery of oil and the development of the aerospace and manufacturing sectors in Los Angeles, it lost, it started to lose ground. It really started to lose ground almost as soon as, you know, the earthquake of 1906. 
Um, by 1920-something, it was smaller than L.A., and still sort of feeling its oats, but realized something was wrong. And the, the World War II kind of gave San Francisco a boost in the sense that it was, uh, you know, a, a major naval port, which L.A. was not, obviously. L.A. has a man-made port. So San, San Diego and San Francisco were the two major naval ports. But it knew the jig was up. And when World War II was over, San Francisco sort of finally realized, we're over. We don't really matter. We're not that important anymore. Los Angeles is more important than us. And, you know, our status as a capital, a regional capital, is gone. And they felt the, 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 the sense of sort of civic demoralization set in. And they spent a good half a decade, half a century, at least, yearning to get that back. And they finally got it back. But ironically, they got it back because of Silicon Valley, which is not in the city limits, because of the great companies and industry that was founded to the south in San Mateo and Santa Clara counties. And all it's what I find incredibly ironic. In a way, history repeats itself. So the wealth pulled out of the mother load in, you know, El Dorado County, Silver, Placer County, and so on and so forth in the, in the foothills of California is what made San Francisco originally. And now it's the wealth being generated in Silicon Valley to the south, again, outside the city limits, that's remaking San Francisco into a great capital. Well, and you, you also note uh, two great universities that may also help define the San Francisco Compromise, not within the city limits, uh, considerably right. outside of the city, UC Berkeley and Stanford. Stanford being you know, the, 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 the university that its graduates really do want to go to Silicon Valley, UC Berkeley, the, the more activist or left-wing uh, part of the right. part of the system, um, but also though. So, but but preceding the Silicon Valley thing is is the left wing incursion into San Francisco, or the, or the rise yeah. of the alternative lifestyle hippie thing that is we all know so well in pop culture. Right. Uh, so I try to trace the history of that, and I, you know, I I'm, I make some educated guesses. I mean, it's, I don't know that anyone can say exactly how and why it happened. I think part of the reason why it happened. And um, I actually got a little pushback from my editors. I had to word this very carefully, and I didn't mean anything by it because I'm Catholic myself. But it, it is always – San Francisco has always had, if not an overwhelmingly, at least at least a plurality Catholic upper class, which is different than New York, Philadelphia, Boston, any of the big cities of the East, with the possible exception of Baltimore. And that Catholic upper class was, was just sort of more easygoing about sin, booze, and so on and so forth. So when – for instance, in World War II, when – you know, if you're coming out of Ames, Iowa – and you're spending a week there before you get put on a destroyer and sent to the Pacific, going to the bars and the honky tonks. You had a pretty good time, and you know whatever you know maybe dismal environment that you're coming out of, and you see the city, pretty, basically at 60 to 70 degrees and sunny every day, right? And yeah. you can get as drunk as you want, and you know dance with sort of loose girls in various bars before you go to the Pacific, and nobody complains, right? There's nobody there to look down their nose at you. People liked it. And, you know, Herb Cain is the famous, he's not really well known, I don't think, in America anymore, and never was widely known in America. But he wrote a daily column for the San Francisco Chronicle for more than 50 years, six days a week. Not that easy to do, right? Yeah. Uh, famously yeah. described the city as Baghdad by the Bay. And that was the nickname that stuck. And he wrote that, I want to say, in 1955. It might have been, even been before that. But he was sort of describing that kind of loose atmosphere. So the first thing that made San Francisco a left-wing town was... Kerouac and uh, Allen Ginsberg and Lawrence Ferlinghetti, the so-called Beats, settled in North Beach, which is the Italian neighborhood, or, or used to be, the Italian neighborhood where near Fisherman's Wharf, where the Italian fishermen went. I mean, this is where lived. This is where Joe DiMaggio grew up, for instance. His father oh. sailed a little purseiner out of Fisherman's Wharf, out the gate, caught fish, and brought it back every day. Now it's a complete tourist trap, right? But in those days, it was a real hard, you know, working class Italian. Italian neighborhood. And it was cheap. So the Beats in the 50s were sort of looking, you know, looking for a place to, to, to hang out and have fun. And they settled in North Beach. And Ferlinghetti founded the City Lights bookstore. Allen Ginsberg wrote Howl, premiered Howl, the famous, I think it's actually crummy, but whatever, it's famous, uh, <laughs> premiered Howl at City Lights bookstore, Columbus and Broadway in San Francisco. And they were put on trial for it. A, little, a sort of forgotten thing, a, 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 a civic trial, not even a state trial, San Francisco County. So he was a, um, the, the two vice cops in an undercover operation bought a copy of Howell at the City Lights bookstore and as a sting and said, well, you know, because it's filled with all kinds of obscenities and so on and so forth. And they put Ginsburg on trial and 
they they lost in a spectacular route. I think this was 1957. And it was, you know, kind of the last stand of the old white gloves, my grandmother's, you know, generation of the San Francisco upper class. Just after that said, okay, we give up, right? I mean, we, we, our, heart, our heart really wasn't in it, but now there's no point in kind of fighting this. And so the, the Beats moved in, and the next the next sort of big thing that happened. First of all, I also find it amusing that Barry Goldwater was nominated for the Republican Party uh, uh, nominee in 1964 at the Cow Palace in San Francisco. I mean, yeah. can you imagine that? Not not just that a Republican convention was in San Francisco, but that Barry Goldwater's Republican convention was in San Francisco. I find enormously funny. Yeah. Um, the the next kind of thing that happened, and some of this is happenstance, was. I would say, well, there's two threads. One I didn't really go into in the article. Um, Ken Kesey, who is from, originally from Oregon, um, uh, on the basis of some short stories, got into this Stanford creative writing program in the late 50s, early 60s, which doesn't exist anymore. Anyway, so to make extra money, Kesey volunteered for uh, drug experiments at the Veterans Administration Hospital in Menlo Park, California, in the peninsula in Silicon Valley. Right, and where, what were they doing? Well, the CIA was testing LSD on people, and he would, they would pay him whatever, seventy-five dollars a day or something, and he would take LSD, and then they would talk to him and interview him and take notes on it, under the under the auspices of the federal government. And Kesey thought this was such a gas that he got a job as an orderly at the VA hospital so that he could steal LSD out of the <laughs> lockers where people weren't securing it, and he would start handing it out to the Stanford guys. So this is where you get the original acid heads and the merry mm-hmm. pranksters and that whole. That's how it, that's where it came from. Thank the United States government for this. Yes. I mean, isn't that great? And um, up until that point, nobody knew what LSD really was, and it was legal in California. So people were taking it all over, and they were bas- basically they were taking acid that Kesey stole from the VA hospital of Menlo Park uh, that was created by the U.S. government. Uh, so that brings a lot of weirdos and hippies and so on and so forth to, to California. Uh, the second thing was the Monterey Pop Festival. So, you know, as... These music festivals were cropping up over the 60s. Monterey is a, another Italian fishing town about two hours south of San Francisco. And they were having a huge music festival in the summer of 67. And, the, I'm, you know, this is like getting into the weeds, but I think it's kind of interesting. Yeah. Uh, the famous Mamas and the Papas, you know, Michelle Phillips, they wrote a song. Uh, well, actually, John Phillips wrote a song with a guy named Scott McKenzie called If You're Going to San Francisco, Wear a Flower in Your Hair. Yes. And the song was about if you're going to go to the Monterey Pop Festival, right? And so it's this sort of forgettable song that became this huge hit, yes. right? And all of a sudden, all of these wastrels and nobodies and hippies and just kids who didn't know what the hell they were doing with their lives moved en masse to San Francisco in the summer of 1967. And when they got there, they found that they could rent an entire four-story Victorian in the Haight-Ashbury for like 20 bucks. Yes. Because nobody, because that all that all of these neighborhoods that had been built for a city at a different time and place were empty and just dirt cheap. And in, in, in you know, like I say, the greatest natural harbor in the world where it's 60 degrees and sunny every day. And they're like, what's not to like? I can live on nothing and it's beautiful and it's perfect. And so they poured in to this dirt cheap place and they basically remade it overnight. So, you know, my grandmother who would put on pearls and white gloves and a, and a you know, I magnum dress every day to go to shopping in Union Square is looking around her one day and realizes what the hell happened to my town. Yeah. And they freaked out, but they didn't know what to do. And they basically didn't put up any opposition. And within a couple of years, the, le- the lefties from all over the country just had taken the place over. And, and and here we are with uh, San Francisco as it as it currently exists. Yeah. Um, yeah. So uh, thinking about uh, and of course you know <laughs> a brilliant opening in the essay Jerry Garcia. Uh, we, we yeah. Don't know, but reputed to have said near his death, Netscape opened at what? Uh, and, right. Because he died the same day. Yeah, he the died the same day as the Netscape IPO, which was the first IPO of the dot-com. I forgot what, August something, but 1995, right? That's so right. Netscape, people probably don't remember, was an internet, the first real commercially viable internet browser that um, got, you know, ordinary folks, you know, you, you, there was an internet before that, but there wasn't really a web. You had to log into these chat rooms and use yeah, net sites and stuff. And it was that. complicated. And you had to know code, right? Netscape was a way if you didn't know any code. You just wanted to look at things. You could do it. And it IPO'd on August something, 1995. 
and you know the strike price was something like 15 and it closed at 58 i mean it just blew the doors off of what people were expecting and jerry garcia probably didn't say that but it captures an essential truth that you know the classic hippie who was born in san francisco by the way and who made his career you know you know how jerry garcia got started the Grateful Dead was the jam band for Ken Kesey's acid tests. So the acid tests were these 72-hour, Ken Kesey would rent a hall somewhere, and he wouldn't tell the people, he would, you know, he rents like a VA hall, and he wouldn't tell them what they were doing. He says, eh, we're just going to have a little get-together, and they'd be like, all right, we need the money. And they would set up strobe lights, set up a stage for the band, and for 72 hours, people would drop acid, and the Grateful Dead would play, literally just continuously, take a break every once in a while, but just play. And that's how Jerry Garcia's band got started in the 60s, playing at the acid tests. And, you know, Garcia had his problems. He got addicted to drugs. You know, he really messed up his life. But at some point, he figured out, you know what, I can't live like this anymore. It's really stupid. And he became a good businessman. And he organized the band, and he regularized the tours, and he marketed uh, a line of neckties, which I find hilarious because I don't think he ever wore one in his whole life. Um, He licensed his name to Ben & Jerry's to make Cherry Garcia ice cream. Cherry Garcia, yeah. And and he had a solid income and a real balance sheet and a P&L that he knew how to run. So it was that, that's what's funny to me about that joke, which I do believe was a joke, is that it's plausible yeah. that Jerry Garcia was wondering what happened in this IPO because he wasn't really a hippie anymore. He was just playing a hippie, but he had a successful business that he ran in a sensible way when he died. Yeah. Well, you know, you talk about this, this marriage of, of the San Francisco left and Silicon Valley money. Don't don't search for theoretical coherence. You say it's it's something yeah. else. It's a practice. It it works for both sides. Um, but I, so, so briefly, so what, what is the? And I want I want to push back maybe on that for a second. But what does the left give the techies? The left gives the techies legitimacy. I mean, to, in my view, I mean, money always needs legitimacy. Or to say that maybe a little bit better, extraordinary wealth inequality needs legitimacy. And I think I have a paragraph in there that says, look, you know, borrowing from Aristotle, right? Aristotle says there's always going to be the rich and the poor and the few and the many. And Aristotle says it doesn't actually – there's no there's no theoretical reason why the few have to be rich and the many have to be poor. But as a matter of practice, I've never seen it any other way, and I don't think it's ever going to be any other way. So if you're always going to have the rich and the poor and you're always going to have the few and the many, then the few are always going to be rich and the many are always going to be poor. And that's going to lead to envy and instability. And so the few who are rich need some kind of legitimacy to justify their privilege. Otherwise, the many are going to get mad and come at them with pitchforks or guillotines or whatever. And what the left gives the San Francisco upper class is legitimacy. They, and, and, you know, the wealth inequality in the Bay Area is now, I, I believe, Absurd. it's at Bourbon levels. It's, you know, 1785 yeah. in San Francisco now, which when I was a kid... It was not. It was. It was trending expensive, right? I mean, my parents, San Francisco, so of the '60s, was actually cheap compared to what it was. It was underpriced. When I was a kid, it was probably normal. But now it's so far beyond. I mean, I one of the things that I trace is my father was a lawyer, still is, but doesn't live there anymore. Um, and his first job was for Melvin Belli, who was a very, very famous lawyer in his day. Um, among other things, he defended Jack Ruby in the. Oh, wow. uh, uh, you know, Jack Ruby, of course, shot Lee Harvey Oswald, Kennedy's assassin. Anyway, Bell I bought what I think is still San Francisco's most expensive house uh, in the 70s for, you know, what was seemed like a staggering amount of money then, but is a pittance now. If you trace the value just of that house and compare it to, A, the inflation rate, and B, the S&P 500, that house is the best investment you could possibly have made, <laughs> as is any investment in San Francisco real estate in the 60s or 70s. They would have blown away every other asset class by several factors. Yeah. Well, it's interesting to think about. I mean, a friend of mine said to me, you know, he, he wanted to uh, print a bumper sticker that said, uh, you know, frack the Silicon Valley plutocrats. And in the sense of you know, the oil barons, the railroad barons, um, uh, others, uh, you know, uh, other financial types um, at different points in, the, in you know, the story of American capitalism, all sought to do things with your wealth, as you're describing, to legitimate it. But it, it, it seemed to bring in the working class and the middle class. So that's libraries, yeah. that's, that's universities, it's monuments or th- well, parks or things like 
things that really brought a lot of people uh, and, and helped build civil society. <clears throat> and my friend's point was Silicon Valley plutocrats don't do that. Uh, with, right. their wealth, I, or with their philanthropy, you know, notable, I, I, you know, maybe with the Zuckerbergs uh, and that ridiculous contribution to the New York public schools, which any rational which he choice, might as well have set on fire. Well, yeah, but any anyone we can leave have, that aside. Yeah, exactly, could have told him that was that was not going to work. And so, as you're describing, we have this marriage with the left in San Francisco as a way to legitimize. Right. Well, and I, I draw yeah. this out, and I, maybe I don't go into it enough, but it's a point worth raising that one of the things that has made San Francisco a successful city in a lot of ways is its old upper class was very, very committed to its cultural institutions. And, you know, San Francisco it used to have a port. It, it, I mean, it, the port is now basically Oakland or LA. The San Francisco port is kind of meaningless at this point. Um, it had a lot of light manufacturing and it was the place where other Northern Cal, where if you were a Northern California baron of something or other, you settled there, you know, some of the great fortunes, you know, Levi Strauss, uh, the denim magnate, one of the most successful companies in the world still today, based there, was founded there. Um, the Spreckles family, which made sugar, uh, and uh, some of their big refineries, sugar refineries, were down where my family lives now, you know, in, in Santa Cruz County and in Monterey County. Uh, they lived there, and so on and so forth. So these mansions and these fortunes that were based on the old-fashioned stuff, you know, commodities, dry goods, things that you could say improve people's lives, where did they put their money? Well, they, they put it into the opera. They put it into the children's hospital. They put it into the Steinhardt Aquarium. They put it into the de Young Museum. They put it into sort of old-fashioned philanthropic endeavors that wealthy families used to do. And as the generations went on, the heirs did the same. The Gettys, another one, you know, basically the fortune was uh, an oil fortune made uh, in, mostly in L.A., but around the world. But they eventually you know, settled in San Francisco. But they put their money into all of these old institutions. So all of a sudden, the, the, and the new crop of Silicon Valley zillionaires, you know, let's say from the 90s onward, they've got fortunes bigger than any of these old barons ever had. And the old families, the old Pacific Heights families come around and say, okay, it's time to donate to the opera. It's time to donate to the de Young. It's time to donate to the symphony. It's time to do, and, they, and the Silicon Valley people said, I don't want to do that. That's your stuff. That's, that's sort of that old snob stuff. What do I care? I'm going to give, you know, I want to give laptops to yak herders in outer Mongolia. You know, I want to do <laughs> potable water in the Congo. I want the, the more kind of obscure and distant the project, the more interested the Silicon Valley people were, and the old upper class was really quite annoyed by that. I mean, their view was, if you're going to come here and buy our houses in Pacific Heights and live our spectacular life, you got to blend into our way, because that's the way everybody's already always done it. And the Silicon Valley people said, no, I don't want to, I don't have to, and by the way, I'm richer than you, so... So, Go to hell, yeah. basically. And there's a big tension between them, uh, you know, those two classes, with, of course, the old upper class losing. Yeah. So you say, you say on this point specifically, I think, in, in the essay, the central purpose of San Francisco values uh, is then to justify, obfuscate, glamorize, exalt, and deflect attention from House of Bourbon uh, levels of wealth yeah. concentration and equality. Um, and, and also you say... Uh, to just so deflect attention from that, and in the foundation of a just social hierarchy based on a left wing conception of virtue. Yeah, right. So, one of the ways that you you know confer legitimacy, I think I say this is you know San Francisco perfected the idea, didn't invent it, but it perfected the idea of opinion morality, right? So your morality is based on the opinion you hold. I mentioned this guy Brendan Eich, right? So Brendan Eich, maybe not a famous person, but I'll explain who he is. Oh yeah, he's a yeah. programmer who uh, invented, with some other people, the Mozilla browser. So Mozilla, we were talking about Netscape earlier, sort of keeping in kind. So Mozilla is another web browser. Netscape is long gone, was a for-profit company, didn't work out. Mozilla is a nonprofit that makes an open source browser, but, uh, and we're run by a 501c3 foundation, which I uh, founded and started and ran. But turns out that he gave $1,000, I think, to Proposition 8 in 2008 in California, which was the ballot initiative that said, you know, California defines marriage to be between one man and one woman, which, by the way, was endorsed by President uh, Obama, candidate Obama at the time, because he hadn't won yet. And it passed overwhelmingly. Um, you know, maybe four or five years later, somebody dug that out of the CalPERG records. Hey, this guy gave $1,000 to Prop 8. Therefore, he's an anti-gay bigot and counted him out of his job. Yeah, yeah, that's kind of the way San Francisco values works now. If you hold the right opinions, you can 
you know, own thirty million dollar mansion in Pacific Heights and throw a hundred thousand dollar birthday, you know, party for yourself on your fortieth birthday and basically live like like Louis the Sixteenth. Yeah. Um, if you don't hold the right opinions and you live in a mere two and a half million dollar three bedroom ranch house in Atherton, and you you know kind of do the wrong thing or say the wrong thing, you get fired and you'll never be have get a job for the rest of your life. Well, or, uh, yeah. And, and it, yeah. Well, oh, I think of Tim Cook. Yeah, I'm here and interviewing you in Indianapolis. Uh, you know, mm-hmm. b- uh, helicoptering in to uh, to in- to instruct right. Indiana that we're a state of bigots because of. Meanwhile, he's he's education. selling iPads in Saudi Arabia, yeah, exactly. which will you know cut your hand off, for, you know, and then he doesn't care. But you know, yeah. it's all about yeah, yeah. No, that that's that's very much the San Francisco way of looking at things. Even though, of course, Apple is in Cupertino, but that that part of the point of the essay was to say how much the city is now defined by the valley, the valley, uh, which in in the in the heyday of of San Francisco's glamour and glory. They would have sneered at the idea that any anybody from the valley or that any idea or thought from the valley could define them. That was the yeah. dismal bedroom community suburbs where the financial mu- district middle middle managers worked and took the Caltrain. I mean, they just looked down on it. The idea that th- those that area is now more important and that its money saved the city and now defines the city. You know, those those glamorous ladies going to the War Memorial Opera House in you know 1960, they would really be appalled. I'm, I'm probably many of them are glad they didn't live to see it. Yeah, but also increasingly, it seems uh, the Democratic Party and at large the country, when it when it comes to a lot of controversial social questions. Oh, uh, I mean, I, I mean, I think that's uh, you. I mean, you you hint at that at, in, in the end of the essay, a brilliant term, the Davos Archipelago, uh, yeah, and and getting at the idea that uh, you know this really they really have set the tone for the country. On these, questions. yeah, I mean, when Jean Kirkpatrick made fun of the San Francisco Democrats. Her view was, you're kind of fringe weirdos, and America's not going to go for this. And that was true in 1984, because Reagan, of course, defeated the San Francisco Democrats in a landslide. He won 49 states, including California, uh, which and George Bush won California in 1988, and no Republican has since, and probably never will again, as long as you and I are alive. Um, it seemed crazy then. And, you know, part of – that's one of the things I tried to bring out from – Talbot's book, but also everybody, everybody, everybody who writes about San Francisco from a sort of friendly insider perspective, Gary, um, oh, I'm forgetting his name, wrote Cool Gray City of Love, a decent, decent book. Okay. But their point is, you know, uh, oh, yeah, we were, you thought we were crazy in the 60s and 70s, but now our ideas rule. And but they mean it as a thumbs up, positive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, we're not so crazy anymore because we've taken over. My, I basically agree with them. The only thing we disagree on is whether that's good or bad. Yeah. Well, it was a question yeah. that I had, you know, thinking about uh, the demographer Joel Kotkin has written on uh, Silicon Valley. And, you know, maybe uh, if we think about this sort of alliance you're describing in the essay we're discussing, it's more enduring uh, than we might admit. And, and Kotkin argues uh, that it's because Silicon Valley actually, you know, really doesn't need a middle class country to make its products work. Unlike large manufacturing concerns uh, in, in mid-century or early 20th century America, so Henry Ford would be the classic example, and it really doesn't need, to, uh, you know, a, a lot of employees uh, making middle-class wages to, to to make its products. It and it, it really is the case that it's 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 this ginormous industry. Pretty much anyone can buy their products, and and but they exist at an elite level and are not really concerned about the rest of the country. And, and even yeah. insofar as they, as they technologically innovate, and if they were to really push the boundaries the way Peter Thiel says they're not, um, if they were even to move in that direction, it wouldn't be for the benefit of the country at large. It would be for the benefit of a very few. Yeah, I, I put my finger on that a long time ago, and I, I remember this coming up in debate a few times, you know, a decade or so ago, where... Others, I didn't say it publicly then, but others would say it publicly. Like, I don't get the sense that these guys are patriotic. And you would get this incredible howl. Well, of course they are. You know, how dare you? You can't question anybody's patriotism. But if you actually go and you talk to anybody in Silicon Valley, it's not that they're anti-American. Some of them probably are, but most, you know, in in a way that, you know, I would say the actual, you know, the professional left class in San Francisco, Berkeley, oh yeah, they're anti-American, no question about it, right? And most of them will even say so. Some of them will yell at you just because they think they can score a debating point by denouncing you for having said it. If you look at the rhetoric, there's no question about it. Most of the Silicon Valley guys aren't so much anti-American as they just don't care. Their view is this is just a place. There is no country. Who cares? Borders are meaningless. It's just, you know, how do we fit into the global? 
to the you know the, the the global system, globalization, supply chain, and so on and so forth. And that's what I was part of what I was trying to get by get across with the, the Davos Archipelago is that's all that matters to them. There are these places in the world that are connected, and then this sort of kind of blurred out gray zone that just doesn't matter. Well, you know. They don't buy our products, in, you know, in these places. Like, yeah. <laughs> so who cares, right? We, 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 there's no sub- relevant supply chain there. Um, there's no resource that we need from this place, and the people don't buy our product, and they're actually kind of hostile to our to our values. So, the hell with them. We're just going to bypass it and pretend it's not there, yeah. and we're only going to pay attention to the to the to the parts of the world that are linked up to our, you know, supply chain market. And you know conference centers and you know, you know the places where my frequent flyer miles take me. Yeah, the rest doesn't matter. Might as well not even be there. So in a way, I mean, I, yeah, something I wanted you, you mentioned this briefly in the essay, and it almost kind of seems like we dis, we dismissed it in our conversation as how conservative or Republican appeals fell flat uh, from yeah. the beginning. Yeah. Well, that's been I mean, that's been a big yeah. that, that has been a dream. So I mean, California was. You know, a solid, a, a solidly Republican state for quite a long time. In a, in a, it, well, that is at the presidential level, and even at the state level, it was Democratic, but a very much a kind of old-fashioned. You know, we're going to build infrastructure. You know, sort of broad-shouldered Democratic. I mean, people. You know, the current governor is Jerry Brown, yeah. who, when I was a child, was also the governor. And uh, appointed my mother to the bench, by the way. Thank you, Governor Brown. And uh, was known as Governor Moonbeam because he was this sort of weird guy who yeah. lived on a mattress on the floor and was dating Linda Ronstadt and such and such. But Governor Brown's father was Governor Pat Brown, who Ronald Reagan defeated in 1966, um, but who had been uh, governor of California for two terms. Now, Pat Brown was not some kooky, weird, wild-eyed Democrat. Pat Brown is the guy who built up the state university system, who built uh, a lot of California's highway system, who built these incredible uh, irrigation system, the water system of California, which is the most complex and uh, probably important w- irrigation system ever built in the history of the human race. This is that sort of old-fashioned Democrat that's going to do stuff. Uh, you know, that's not now, – nowadays, California Democrats, they, well, they mostly – uh, block stuff, or when they do stuff, they do stupid stuff, like they borrow $3 billion or however much they borrowed on a state bond initiative to build a train that goes from Fresno to Bakersfield or something that they call high-speed rail that's idiotic, that'll never get finished, and that no one's going to ride if it does get finished. That's not Pat Brown's California. I mean, Pat, the, the California, to the extent that it has a functioning infrastructure today, it's because of him. Um, yeah. And, it, you know, California changed... Almost overnight, like I can remember when it happened. I was in Berkeley in 1988 as a freshman. I guess I was a sophomore, actually. But my first presidential election, you know, I voted for George H.W. Bush. Now, he lost Alameda County, of course, but he won the state. (laughs) Yeah. And no Republican ever has since, and no Republican ever will again. Uh, It is completely different now because the character of, you know, my grandparents' generation of New Deal, FDR style, get stuff done, we're going to build things and make California great again. Democrats are completely gone, and they've been replaced by this new you know, lifestyle Democrat and the NIMBY Democrats. Yeah. And I actually, one of the reasons I mentioned environmentalism semi-favorably is I have certain sympathy for it. You know, I mean, Yellowstone is actually the first national park in the country, but the next I want at least two, and I want to say more than two, were in California, Sequoia National Park and, and Yosemite National Park. So it's one of the places where the conservation movement was born. California has more of the national parks than any other state in the Union, by far, actually, nine. I think the next next most is uh, Alaska's got five, right? And it, 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 you see these spectacular places, and you cry, of course I want this to be conserved. You know, you see the San Francisco Bay, you see these, these wonderful glories of nature, and you say, of course I want this conserved. But one of the one of the ways that this is one of the things, I didn't really bring this out in the essay, but I kind of wish I had, that the, 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 the California left is hypocritical, but rationally hypocritical, is they use all this nimbyism and all these environmental regulations and things as a way of saying, I like this the way it is and I don't want it to change. So you're not going to build more housing, you're not going to put a highway here, you're not going to do this, you're not going to do that, because it's, it's really neat the way it is. And I'm, since I'm already here, I don't care how much more expensive it gets. Yeah. All that does is prevent other people from moving in. And since I don't want you here anyway, that's great. And it means my own you know, uh, property value is going to go up so that by the time I'm ready to cash out, all I've got to do is sell my house, and that's my 401k. I mean, I've got friends who 
you yeah, know, yeah, they bought yeah. some place in Palo Alto or wherever in the early 80s. And they might as well have not even bothered to put money away yeah. in a 401k yeah, because no, no. all they got to do is sell that house and they they could live to 100 and they couldn't spend the money. Yeah, no, I've, I've heard that. We think, too, I mean, how many of the middle class families have left California uh, for other states? There's been a mass, a uh, mass exodus. Who would have voted? Yeah. Who would have been the Republican voters? Uh, you know, well-known story: rental vans from various destinations in Southern California to Texas cost a lot more than the other way around. Um, yeah, yeah. So you, yeah, you think about that. We're oh, thinking though. So interesting with the example, the rational, rational environmentalists. But of course, that means that you have a state that's increasingly a playground and is increasingly a top-down state without much of a middle. Uh, so, yeah. so it starts to look like, you know, a Latin American country, maybe. Um, yeah, and, yeah well, that's, uh, I've, I've actually, I don't think I said that. that in the essay, but I've been saying that in a long, for a long time. Yeah. I mean, that's exactly what it looks like. It's a top, it's a top bottom economy where the middle, you, the, the only way you can matters. survive, yeah. the only way you basically can survive there is if you, you bought a long time ago when you could afford it or you inherit your property, right? Or you, you work for the state. And, you know, you have a secure job and tenure and a pension, but then you, have to, you, have, you still got to live somewhere, right? So if you're a cop in San Francisco or a firefighter in San Francisco, and by the way, those are hard jobs to get. Every time there's openings for some of these jobs in a place like San Francisco, the, you know, the applicants are 200 to 1 for every slot. Let's say you get the job. Now what? Right? Yeah. It's not that easy to find a place where you can live, where you can afford to live, and get your fanny into work every day. Yeah. Um, I mean, look. Let me let me just be, you know, somewhat candid here. Look, I live in New York. Uh, I live in one of the most expensive suburbs of New York City. And if I wanted to go home and try to replicate the lifestyle that I have here, I couldn't even come close. It's impossible. <laughs> it would cost me at least three times what I make now. And, you know, I make a pretty nice living. Yeah. And I, I couldn't even... I couldn't even, on the money that I make, which is way more than my parents ever made, I couldn't even do a third of the lifestyle that I grew up in. In California right That's now, incredible. in Northern California. Yeah. Um, so, so let's let's talk fault lines. Um, and you, and you, you talk about this, but and fault lines meaning that this mayor between the left and Silicon Valley. Um, so, wh- what do you see there? Do you, I mean, one of the things, the questions that I had in, in thinking about this is, uh, you know, the NSA report and and the Snowden mm-hmm. files did not really seem to involve the left turning against Silicon Valley, uh, even though. No. Even though Silicon Valley had largely complied with the government, uh, your thoughts on that and, and other areas where we might see a fracturing? There's, well, there was a little of it. For instance, Condoleezza Rice, to, for whom I used to work, for whatever that's worth, um, <laughs> was named a uh, board member of Dropbox, which is a file storage locker, you know, cloud storage locker company. And the Silicon Valley people howled about that because they said, look, she was around when the NSA was doing this. And when a lot of these things were revealed, she defended it and, you know, can't trust her on privacy. And Dropbox got into a PR, con- you know, kind of a crisis over that. So that is a fault line. For the, for the most part, Silicon Valley is able to keep that stuff squelched by, uh, I would say, essentially two factors. Number one is just its cachet, Right. It's cool. It's the good. It's good. It's a good business, right? Bad businesses are like you know, oil. <laughs> By the way, one of the world's largest oil companies, Chevron, uh, was founded in San Francisco and was based on Market Street for a hundred years and moved to San Ramon in the East Bay about fifteen years ago. Um, you know, so there's good money and there's bad money. There's good ways to make money and bad ways. And for now, this tech is, is still a good way, and so they get kind of a pass. Secondly. You know, they, they know how to buy off lefty activists by setting up these nonprofits and stuff like that and giving them contracts and so on and so forth so that people sort of know, well, my bread is buttered here, so I better not, you know, I better not complain too much about what they do. Uh, it, 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 and and it's, it's rather a cheap business model. You know, you set up a nonprofit to do this, you hire a little bit of staff, you give a few contracts here, you have some parties there, you pour some of the nice Napa wine, you invite the right people, and everybody leaves thinking, yeah, I'm not going to maybe throw any slings and arrows at that guy because he's been pretty nice to me. Whereas, oh, look, an oil company or, you know, oh, look, uh, you know, some other, you know, evil business, oh, a bank, uh, I can yell at them. Uh, whereas, you know, file sharing app, oh, no, they're the good guys. Yeah. Well, you also have seen reports of you know just things happening in San Francisco with property values, as we've been discussing, uh, obviously. But you know there was episodes, several episodes of these buses that Google uses to take its employees back and forth being hounded uh, by, yeah. by various activists. So some some sort of an awareness that 
for all the talk of diversity and multiculturalism and inequality, uh, it is really stark and in your face. Well, yeah. So what happened there is, you know, Google is based in Mountain View, which is one of the Silicon Valley, you know, sort of old dreary suburbs that's now the center of the world because of Google and these places. Uh, also, it also has offices south of market in the city itself. But um, a lot of the young workers would prefer, you know, nobody who wants to live in Mountain View, even if you could afford it. But like, why would you want to unless you're, you know, grown up and you got kids and, you know, that that sort of you know, the old California dream of a, a ranch house with a front yard and a backyard. If you're 25 and you, you know, just got out of Stanford or Harvard or something and you've moved to San Francisco, you want to be in the city. You want to be where the cool kids are, where the fun is. Interestingly, too, as I sort of note in the piece, um, you know, Google was founded, I think, in 2001. In those days, these, you know, these companies set up in the valley. Even Facebook, which I think was only founded in 2000. I don't know, four, six, something like that, found in the valley. Nowadays, when you do your startup, you found it in the city. Nobody founds a company in the valley anymore. The only reason you go down to the valley is to raise venture capital. And half of them have offices in the city anyway, so the hell with the valley, right? So the kids want to live in the city, but then, you know, it's, it's 20 minutes down the freeway. And one of the, you know, Google uh, pioneered this idea that, oh, we're going to have these buses bring everybody to the campus in Mountain View so that, uh, you know, it's a quality of life thing. We'll have Wi-Fi on the bus. You know, you can look at your <laughs> you never app and so on and so forth. Yeah. Right. And, well, one of the places the bus picks up is on Dolores Street in the Mission. Now, the Mission is the the, um, the old Mexican-American district, Hispanic, but really Mexican-American district. It's called the Mission District because of the original Saint Fran- Mission St. Francis de Assisi, which is one of the two there well, there's really three original settlements that make San Francisco, San Francisco. Mission San Francisco de Assisi, which is a Catholic church founded by Cardinal Winipro Serra in Golly. I don't actually remember the date, but I want to say 1776. Uh, the second is the Presidio, which is the fort that overlooks the Golden Gate in case anybody tried to invade. They had cannons up there to shoot at you, which were never fired in history because nobody ever tried to invade until the Americans came. And then nobody was manning the cannons when the Americans came. Uh, and Yerba Buena Cove which is now the financial district in the original port. So that mission around Mission Dolores became the original kind of Mexican-American neighborhood of San Francisco. And you, know, you get the great tacos, you get this, you get that. And it was one of the cheaper parts of the city until all the hipsters uh, and the tech kids started to move in and the rents just went right through the roof. And the Google bus became a symbol of that. It was all of these old timers, some, a lot of them Mexican, a lot of them not Mexican, but they just remembered it when it was like, hey, I can afford to live here. You know, they notice that, you know, my shoe repair shop is now, you know, selling $4 cups of coffee. Um, the dry cleaner that I used to use is gone, and it's, and, you know, it's, it's an Apple store, and so on and so forth. All the regular neighborhood businesses, the hardware stores have went away, were replaced by all kinds of hipster expensive stuff. Rents tripled, and people that had been there for 100 years can't afford their home anymore, and they got mad. And some of the more... <laughs> um, truculent of them, let us say, would you know throw tomatoes at the Google bus because to them it was just a symbol of everything that was going wrong with San Francisco, um, and you know that that is that has been a problem. And I haven't heard about it lately, but there have been a number of those incidents where you know they do something to the bus or they would form a human chain and try to block it from you know leaving. Um, and you, you, you know, you, if you're every time I'm home, my parents don't live in the city, although they have a place in the city. Um, but you know, they get to Chronicle, and I'm always looking at it. And I'd say a good third of the time, there's something going on with <laughs> the yeah. activists in some of these old neighborhoods getting mad that their neighborhood isn't what it used to be. So, Michael, thank you so much uh, for talking with us today. We've been talking with Michael Anton about the San Francisco compromise. Thank you so much. Thank you. This is your host Richard Greinch, and you have been listening to a podcast that can be found at libertylawsite.org, where you can subscribe, comment, and find other episodes and links related to today's conversation. Our email address is lal at libertyfund.org.